my pleasure to introduce Alexandria Abdallah to all of you. Alexandria completed her undergraduate education at American University, where she majored in philosophy and religious studies. She then attended the University of Pittsburgh for her master's degree in bioethics and successfully defended her thesis and graduated in 2019. Alex is currently working as a program director at Fair Oaks of Pittsburgh, which is an assisted living facility in Brookline. I had the privilege of serving on Alex's thesis committee, and I'm so pleased that she's agreed to give this presentation on death with dignity and its implications for individuals with Alzheimer's disease this afternoon. Take it away, Alex. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Alex. Thank you, Dr. Lingler, for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about physician-assisted suicide and how the current legislation does not allow um, patients with dementia to participate. Um, let me get my slides up. Okay. So um, I'm gonna start with the objectives. So today, the three main goals are going to be to identify the main difference between physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia and how different countries' laws affect who has access. So the distinguishing between physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia will be important for our talk today because the United States only allows for physician-assisted suicide and not euthanasia. Um, but our laws are pulled from countries that do allow euthanasia. Um, the second goal will be to understand why more inclusive death with Dign dignity acts would be beneficial to those diagnosed with de dementia, especially during this tumultuous time. I'll explain that later on. Um, it has to do with COVID and, um, and how it affected people with dementia anecdotally. Um, and then the third objective is to identify how the lack of inclusiveness in the United States Death of Dignity Acts directly impacts people with dementia and how this differs from other countries' physician-assisted suicide laws. So again, that will be important. Um, it'll be important to distinguish between physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia because of the other countries' laws. So um, Oregon was the first state to legalize physician-assisted suicide. Um, it was in October of 1997. Um, since then, Oregon has been followed by 10 um, other 11 jurisdictions. Um, one of them is the District of Columbia. Um, and Montana Supreme Court has ruled that physician-assisted suicide is allowed, but not but did not explicitly enact a death with death with the dignity act. Um, obviously, this is a highly controversial topic, um, both because um, the idea is that people with dementia do not have the cognitive capacity to make a decision like this, and because of the nature of um, physician assisted suicide being suicide. Um, currently, you can only access physician assisted suicide if you have a six month terminal diagnosis, which obviously excludes patients with dementia because they will no longer be cognitively capable of deciding to participate in physician assisted suicide. Um, in this talk, um, I consider dementia a terminal diagnosis, even though um, death is give or take eight years on average. Um, and the last six months of the disease, um, because of the progression of it, people will not be able to decide to participate in physician assisted suicide. Um, so I will argue that we remove the six month terminal um, diagnosis guideline from the current Death with Dignity Acts. So um, physician assisted suicide laws were first enacted in the Netherlands um, as the result of the State Commission of Euthanasia in 1985. Um, the State Commission of Euthanasia concluded that euthanasia was technically illegal, but that if physicians were to adhere to three outlined cr 
criteria, they would not be prosecuted in the court of law for providing euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. So the Netherlands use, uses both euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. Um, the Dutch Euthanasia Act allows patients with an array of diseases to participate in both physician assisted suicide and euthanasia. Um, providing that they, physicians follow the following criteria. So voluntariness, unbearable suffering, and um, consultation. Voluntariness um, requires that the patient has been asked to participate in, has asked to participate in physician-assisted suicide of their own volition. So no one is coercing them, um, they're not being forced, and that they have sufficient decision-making capacity to do so. We will discuss decision-making capacity later on as it relates to dementia, because it is so important um, when asking for physician-assisted suicide. Um, the unbearable suffering clause means that the patient will not recover from their illness and that the condition cannot be ameliorated. So that there's no known um, way to stop their suffering. Obviously we have hospice and palliative care and those do work to an extent in a lot of cases. Um, but in the case of people who want to participate in physician assisted suicide and euthanasia, um, that suffering cannot, cannot be stopped um, through various means. Um, consultation, and this is important because um, it, it's a big basis for the United States physician assisted suicide laws um, and a large part of the Death Dignity Acts. Um, but in the Netherlands, consultation means that attend the attending physician must discuss the patient's condition as well as their request with another physician who then consults on the patient's case to see if they meet the criteria to participate in physician assisted suicide. Um, so essentially it's a checks and balances set of criteria. So the attending physician will assess the patient to see if they are asking for euthanasia or physician assisted suicide, because we're talking about the Netherlands, um, of their own volition. So they're not being coerced and that they meet the criteria of unbearable suffering. Their suffering cannot be ameliorated by any means. Um, and then that attending physician consults a, another physician who must agree to that criteria as well. So the patient is asking on their own volition and they have unbearable suffering. Um, they then, once the patient has been granted euthanasia or physician assisted suicide, because again, it, it could be both, we're in the Netherlands. Um, and after the it's been granted, so the patient is now dead from the drugs that have been used. Um, the case is presented to a euthanasia review committee, which um, goes over the physician's actions and the patient's disease to determine whether or not the case has been carried out with due care. So have they um, used, oh, sorry, um, have they have they determined that um, both the attending and the consulted physician have um, considered the request and that it's a voluntary request? Have they looked at um, the suffering of the patient? Have they informed the patient about treatment options um, as well as their medical condition? Um, the idea of a cure comes to mind. So do you know that there could be a cure in the next 10 years and you may not die within that time span? Um, so we've exhausted all options and the patient does not want to seek a um, cure if it comes up um, and that they have um, carried out the, that the physician has carried out the end of life in um, a medically correct way so that they're adhering to all medical guidelines. Um, I think now we should note the difference between physician assisted suicide and euthanasia. So um, euthanasia in the Netherlands is defined as the active termination of a patient's life at his or her request by a physician. So very simple definition. 
Um, we have physically ended someone else's life upon their request after going through the um, previously noted criteria. I will only be talking about physician assisted suicide, not euthanasia um, for dementia patients. Um, so physician assisted suicide is defined as ending one's own life through the voluntary self-administration of lethal medications expressly prescribed by a physician for that purpose. So in euthanasia, the physician is administering the medication. In physician-assisted suicide, the patient is ingesting it themselves. Um, so that is really important. The, the patient has to be capable of, in the United States and with physician-assisted suicide, the patient has to be capable of picking up the medication and taking it themselves. Um, so for, for this argument, specifically for patients with dementia, I think it's important that they self-administer the medication that it cannot be um, injected or given by a physician is only prescribed by a physician. Um, so uh, in the US, there, is, there are guidelines um, that are similar to the Netherlands. So um, it, the, all the cases have to be reported. Um, physicians have to um, make sure that the patient is asking of their own volition, and it's not through coercion, um, that the patient is of sound mind. There are, again, reporting requirements. So in the United States, um, any physician who does prescribe medication for the intended purpose of a patient using it for physician-assisted suicide, they do have to report um, the condition, when it was given, um, why it was given, all those kinds of things. Um, but in the United States, there's no physician administration. Only the patient can administer the medication um, to themselves. So the history of physician-assisted suicide in the US um, began between the 1860s and the 1930s during the progressive movement. Um, so there were a lot more open conversations surrounding death, um, which led Americans specifically um, to want the natural right to die a natural death. Um, again, we have new ideas growing. Um, death has, isn't as taboo as it once was. Um, people are talking about the best ways to die, um, that kind of thing. The idea of physician-assisted suicide grew from the ancient practice of euthanasia. So um, euthanasia had been used throughout many centuries. Um, but because we're now in this progressive movement, people are talking about it. Um, it's more open and physicians are, are discussing the ability to um, let patients um, die of their own volition. So through um, medications. And the idea comes from this idea of a good death. So um, we live a good life. Can we die a good death where we are um, choosing when to go and why we want to go. Um, and we'll talk about that later through some graphs of who chooses, why they choose, what diseases they have, um, that kind of thing. But essentially the main goal of a good death is to alleviate suffering and avoid future suffering. So those tend to be the biggest fears of people who know that they're going to die um, within six months or a year or whatever. Um, generally speaking, that's what people say. Um, dignity is another big thing. Um, but these ideas of alleviating suffering, avoiding unnecessary suffering, and um, dying a good death led to the right to die movement. Um, so currently, the right to die movement in the US um, is only governed by physician assisted suicide acts and court rulings. Um, so there are a couple of states who have court rulings that aren't necessarily enacted laws, um, but they say, we're not gonna say no, but we're not explicitly saying yes. Um, so, okay, so one of the, um, the two big cases are um, Vaco v. Quill and Washington v. Glucksburg. So these were the starting cases for physician-assisted suicide. 
Um, Vaco v. Quill um, ruled that it is up to each state to determine whether or not its residents can participate in physician-assisted suicide. So um, they're not ruling it out, but they're not saying, yes, you can, so um, federally. So each state can decide whether or not um, they make Death with Dignity Act laws. Um, Washington v. Glucksburg bolstered this decision. So they determined that Washington's ban on physician-assisted suicide um, was not unconstitutional, but because Vaco v. Quill said that it's up to the states to um, make the decision, Washington could say um, physician-assisted suicide is not um, legal. So um, Oregon, again, was the first state to um, legalize physician-assisted suicide, and they defined the act as medical intervention, which allows terminally ill Oregonians to end their lives through the voluntary self-administration of lethal medication expressly prescribed by a physician for that purpose. Um, so... The other jurisdictions um, include, there's 11 total jurisdictions now. So it's California, Colorado, Maine, New Jersey, Vermont, Washington, DC, Hawaii, New Mexico, and Washington. Um, Baxter v. Montana is the exception to having um, a specific Death with Dignity Act law. Um, they say that it's not, um, prohibited. So the practice is permitted until um, specific laws allow for physician-assisted suicide. Um, so physician-assisted suicide, the requirements are um, pretty extensive. Um, they say that um, a person who is requesting physician-assisted suicide um, must have decision-making capacity and make the request by him or herself. So this is similar to the laws in the Netherlands. It must be of your own volition. Um, they also require that a patient um, be a resident of that jurisdiction. So if you live in Oregon and you want physician-assisted suicide, you can have it. I, from Pennsylvania, cannot go to Oregon and I have six months to live and say, I want to die by physician-assisted suicide. I have to be a resident of that state. Um, you are also required to make two um, requests that are vocal, um, no less than 15 days apart, and then you must make a written request to your attending physician. Um, currently, you have to have a terminal diagnosis of no more than six months to live, um, which is confirmed by your attending physician, and um, then again, confirmed by a um, consulting physician. So just like in the Netherlands, there have to be um, multiple requests and there have to be two physicians that sign off saying, this is a terminal diagnosis and um, you are going to die within six months and both physicians have to say that. Um, again, there are reporting requirements so that in the US it's yearly. Um, so there have to be re yearly reporting requirements. Um, Oregon in this talk is what I is the example that I use because um, their their reporting is is pretty easy to navigate. Um, but every every jurisdiction you have to report um, what the diagnosis was, why the patient wanted to die um, by physician assisted suicide. So um, there are different um, requirements per state. So most of them are similar. A lot of them are based off of Oregon's Death with Dignity Act. Um, the only real exceptions to um, or discrepancies between the acts um, is California says that there is an addition, additional requirement that patients must be informed of feasible alternatives, um, which include but are not limited to um, hospice and palliative care. Um, so sort of that symptom management and the, the other options of alleviating suffering. Obviously, um, we know that hospice and palliative care are fantastic resources and that many, many times they do help relieve suffering. Um, there are still those who want to participate in physician-assisted suicide, 
through various reasons, but because they think that hospice and palliative care um, may not necessarily be able to, to control their suffering. Um, and we'll talk about that more at the end as well. So Washington DC also has a feasible alternative clause. Um, so they just have to know that um, there are other alternatives. The, the key there is that they are not required to participate in those other alternatives. So it only says that you must be aware of the um, other alternatives that exist, so hospice and palliative care. Um, okay, so obviously there are concerns with this, particularly when we talk about dementia. Um, so one of the concerns is that the law can be abused. Um, we get physicians who are prescribing out the wazoo, the people aren't asking of their own volition, they aren't aware of what they're asking for, they don't know that there are alternatives. Um, and that is a, a legitimate concern. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that suggests that, um, that, that people are not abusing it is the data. So around 4.9 out of every 100,000 deaths in Oregon um, are from physician assisted suicide. So these numbers are not astronomical, they aren't growing, they have remained steady for the past four years, um, which is a positive sign. Um, and as you can see in the graph, so Oregon is right here. Um, those are the number of prescriptions who have been given for um, physician assisted suicide death. These are the ones that have been used. So if Oregon prescribed 240 patients, um, physician assisted suicide prescriptions, only 155 have been, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, 33 have been taken. So not everyone that's being prescribed has um, taken these um, prescriptions. So you can be prescribed it and just hold on to it if that makes you more comfortable. So a lot of it is that control. Um, the, um, the other states, so Washington, California, um, those numbers are around the same. Cal Washington's a little bit more, California is a little bit less. Um, but again, all the numbers have remained fairly steady um, throughout the four years, past four years. And um, there's, no, there's no evidence that suggests that that should change. So the Netherlands has the same sort of numbers. They're not seeing astronomical prescriptions um, for physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia. The numbers remain pretty steady. Um, there's no, it's, it records the physicians who are prescribing, so we're not having these physicians that are only prescribing um, euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide drugs. Um, and this is important because abuse is just not seen. Um, Obviously things could be underreported, um, but specifically in the United States, we're not seeing, um, you know, crazy leaps in um, prescriptions. Um, and which is why I am suggesting the removing of the six month terminal illness, because I don't think that access um, to physician assisted suicide, there will be less control. So um, if, patients with dementia were to receive physician assisted suicide access, um, I don't think the numbers would, would jump. So um, again, the six month requirement is, um, is obviously based on a, a moral quandary. So people are going to die anyways, we know they're going to die. Um, they should have a choice in how soon they die, they have, we have access to these drugs and we can give them to them to ingest themselves. Um, Later on, I will talk about dementia as a terminal diagnosis and through a series of um, competency tests showing that they are capable of asking for physician assisted suicide, that they should have access. Um, so in the Netherlands, I, this is important to note that in the Netherlands, there is no terminal illness requirement. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier when discussing the Netherlands, but there is no specific um, clause saying you have to have, in order to have access, you will die in six months. Um, that's not the case. So a lot of different people have access and specifically in the Netherlands, patients with dementia do have access to physician assisted suicide as well as euthanasia. Um, again, I'm only talking about the US and I'm only discussing physician assisted suicide. So if dementia patients were to have access, they would have to, um, 
they would have to have a competency test and they would only have access to physician assisted suicide, not euthanasia. So the ruling of Baxter v. Montana is important because um, it clearly defines the um, that terminally ill patients um, have access to physician assisted suicide and they don't have a six month requirement. Um, so the story of Baxter v. Montana is Robert Baxter was a truck driver um, who was diagnosed with um, leukemia. He went through multiple rounds of chemo and um, had serious side effects, infection, chronic fatigue, anemia, nausea, um, pain, and he had no hope for recovery. There was no cure for his disease. Um, so he wanted the option of taking a lethal dose of medication prescribed by his doctor. Mr. Baxter, along with four other physicians, started a nonprofit called um, Compassion and Choices, and they brought action collectively as the Compassion and Choices to the District Court of Montana. Um, they specifically challenged the um, constitutionality of the application of Montana homicide statutes to physicians who provide aid in dying to mentally competent and terminally ill patients. So they wanted to say that. Um, people who are terminally diagnosed should have access to physician-assisted suicide in the state of Montana. Um, based on the findings in Mr. Baxter's case, they, the District Court of Montana ruled that a patient may use the assistance of his physician to obtain um, a prescription for a lethal dose of medication. Um, so that resulted in the Montana Rights of the Terminally Ill Act. Um, the wording of the act is very important, again, because there's no six month requirement specifically in their act. Um, so the act says that an individual of sound mind, um, an 18 years age of older, has the right to execute at any time a declaration governing the withholding and withdrawing of life sustaining treatment. Um, they then concluded that because of that, the um, patients have a right to end their life um, if that is their wish and that they do not have to be six months terminal. So um, the rights of the Terminal Ill Act clearly provide that terminally ill patients um, are entitled to autonomous end of life decisions, um, even if it involves a direct act of a physician. So if the physician specifically prescribes the medication, so we're not talking about euthanasia, physician assisted suicide, the physician directly prescribes medication. Um, and so they say that the, the court ruling said clearly provides that terminally ill patients are entitled to autonomous end of life decisions, even if the enforcement of those decisions involves direct acts by a physician. So prescription, and there's no indication in the rights of the Terminally Ill Act that an additional means of giving effect to a patient's decision in which the patient, without any direct assistance, so they take it themselves, chooses the time of his own death, um, is against public policy. So they do not say you have to be six month terminal. That is the only jurisdiction that has that. So every other jurisdiction says six months. Um, this will be important for discussion about dementia. Um, because there is no six month clause. So um, the, they, it only has to be incurable, irreversible, irreversible, and will soon result in death. Um, obviously patients with dementia can have anywhere from six to 12 years to live after their diagnosis. Um, I argue that the disease is still a terminal one, whether it's six to 12 years or not. Um, patients are going to die from dementia. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, so I argue that a law permitting physician assisted suicide could be passed that is consistent with the Montana rights of the Terminally Ill Act. So sort of following along with that, um, no six months. So just removing six months, then patients with dementia will have access to physician assisted suicide. So obviously dementia leads to cognitive decline. So it's very important that decision-making capacity is discussed um, specifically with the patient um, by the physician. So um, 
a thorough explanation of this is obviously necessary to how um, a physician determines if a patient, a dementia patient, has capacity to make the choice to end their own life. Um, so I'm arguing that a decision, a, a patient with decision-making capacity um, could make the choice to end their own life, even if they're not going to die within six months. Um, so um, capacity, um, sorry, competency is the ability to perform a task um, and carry out that task over time, but it can be intermittent. So you may be able to do a task today um, and be competent to perform that task, but if you get a concussion, you may no, no longer be competent to perform that task the, ne the next day. Um, so it can um, vary and be intermittent. The definitions between competency and decision-making capacity are similar and they can be used um, interchangeably, but they are dependent on one another. So, um, sorry. So Applebaum and Grisso um, talk about um, assessing competence to consent to treatment in their book. And they specifically highlight um, legal competence and incompetence maxims that um, discuss the functional deficits that can impact a person's decision-making capacity. And obviously this has very practical implications for the assessment of decision-making capacity with patients with dementia. Um, so those, um, so functional abilities are based on the stages of the disease. We'll, we'll go over those. So um, they, a, pay, a physician that's looking at a patient with dementia um, must look at the functional abilities uh, that the person possesses based on the stages of the disease. So um, there are different deficits that might present throughout the different stages of the disease, and that will determine what functional demands the decision to participate in physician-assisted suicide might place on the patient. Um, and because the disease is progressive in nature, um, the patient's ability to make that decision can change. So one day they might come to you and say, I want to participate in physician-assisted suicide. And then in that 15-day um, time period between the second request, they may no longer be able to make that decision. And I think that's really important to clarify because I'm not suggesting that um, just because they asked the first time and um, they were competent and able to make a decision that the second round they might be able to. Um, it's very fluid and um, obviously things need to be considered and weighed. So um, that's very important for deciding whether or not a, a patient with dementia can ask for physician assisted suicide. Um, so it's the, the maxims are important because um, they include the functional abilities of the patient, the psychopathology of the patient, the task demand. So what are we asking the patient to go through with? Do they understand um, what this task will entail? And then the, the consequences, do you understand that if you are to take this medication, you are going to die? Um, so, and then reassessing that, that function. Um, so the functions are, are necessary conditions to be considered for a competent person. Um, and if a, a person is declared competent, then their decision to participate in physician assisted suicide should be respected, whether or not they have dementia. So they're competent to make that, um, decision. So competency and, um, decision-making ability are um, related because if a patient is deemed competent, they will also have decision-making capacity. So if we look at that patient and we say, you are competent, you are capable of um, performing the following tasks, um, you understand the consequences of your actions, um, and we can do this all again in a couple of days, and you, you still present competency, then you have decision-making capacity. Um, in this case, you have the capacity to decide whether or not you participate in physician-assisted suicide. Um, so there are four functional abilities um, that are important to look at specifically. Um, they are the ability to express a choice, um, the ability to understand the information relevant to the treatment decisions. Um, so that would be task demands, 
um, the ability to appreciate and understand the significance um, of the information for one's own situation. So understanding your disease, understanding that there may be a cure in five years and you may not die um, for 10. Um, these are all really important, important things to look at, especially with patients with dementia. Um, and then the ability to reason through the relevant information and to weigh the treatment options um, in light of one's own value. So understanding um, your values for life and death um, and weighing whether or not there, there may be a treatment um, and how that's important to your disease, how far you might progress in, in dementia. Um, you know, you could be good for five years. Um, and there may be a treatment in six, and then you ask for physician suicide. Obviously, you can choose not to take the drug, but um, just understanding and going through, you know, I understand my diagnosis. Um, I understand that I'm going to die, and I understand that there could be a cure. Um, so those are those are really important. Um, again, I'm not um, arguing that if a patient with dementia goes to a physician and says, I want this, then 15 days later, they clearly are not competent to make that decision. A physician can say no, or if there are any discrepancies between, um, you know, physicians, one saying, yeah, I think they're competent and they have decision-making capacity and another saying, no, I do not think they're competent. They do not have decision-making capacity. They do not understand their disease. They do not understand, um, you know, what they're asking. Um, and then in that case, I would say, do not give the patient um, asking for a physician assisted suicide the medication. Um, if there are any, you know, qualms or quandaries, don't do it. I'm not saying 100%. You have to, um, you have to prescribe um, the medication. So in the U.S., you are automatically presumed competent at 18 years old. Um, so you have the ability to express a choice, understanding your information about treatment, um, appreciating the significance of your situation, and then reasoning through that information. Um, again, we'll talk about later on how this affects dementia. Um, so we know that later on in your dementia diagnosis and the progression of your disease, you may not have the ability to express a choice. You may not have the ability to understand the information that there may be um, a treatment out there. Um, you may not be able to understand the significance of your situation. Um, and you may not be able to reason through that information. And in that case, a physician should not allow a patient with dementia um, to have access to physician-assisted suicide. Um, the, the important thing to note here is that a dementia diagnosis did not automatically render the newly diagnosed person incapable of making their own decision. So upon diagnosis, of course, there are cases where there are upon diagnosis, you know, you are not competent, you cannot make your own decision. Um, but, you know, the, uh, you a lot of times patients still are competent. They still have decision-making capacity and they can still make that choice. Um, and, but I'm, I'm saying that you don't always have that. And I, I think it's important to note that um, assessing competency and decision-making capacity are, are very important um, specifically for dementia because we know that the disease is progressive. We know that it affects your mind. We know that it affects um, your decision-making um, abilities. So it should be done on a case by case basis. I'm not giving like a blanket statement case by case. Your physician um, says you can participate or you cannot participate. So a key piece to this argument is that dementia is a terminal diagnosis. Um, so I define dementia as the um, or dementia is defined, sorry, as the loss of cognitive functions, such as thinking, remembering, reasoning, behavioral abilities to um, such that it interferes with daily life. Um, and the cognitive capacities, which are important for understanding the decision that a patient with dementia might make is the um, memory, language skills, visual perception, problem solving, self-management, and the ability to focus. So the ability to focus, you know, easy relation, 15 days apart with your request. You have to say, um, I want to die by physician assisted suicide. And then you have to make that request again. Will they be able to do that? Um, will be based on you know the situation and the disease progression. 
So the loss of cognitive function can be measured on a seven part scale. Um, and it explains what happens at each stage of decline. So the stages are a useful way of thinking about the progression of dementia and are particularly useful um, when we talk about physician assisted suicide. Um, the seven stages range from mild, moderate to severe. Um, stages one through three, typically, obviously they're not set in stone, you know, the disease progresses differently um, depending on the person. Um, but one through three are, are typically no cognitive impairment to mild cognitive decline. Um, the four and five are moderate decline in function um, that may affect your ability to complete tasks, um, notable changes upon um, medical assessment. So MOCA testing, you know, we were fine the first six months, the second six months, you know, we're, we're messing up um, and it's very obvious. Um, and then stages six to seven, there's a major decline with severe loss of cognitive function. Um, they may no longer be able to complete tasks on their own, um, a need for constant supervision, or they it could even be catatonia. Um, so those are important because um, we are comparing um, the competency and decision-making capacity to the stages. Um, so if your patients, you know, on the last stages of dementia, they probably are not capable of asking for a physician assisted suicide. And upon assessment, um, it would be unlikely that they would be granted physician assisted suicide. Probably um, they would not. Um, so it's important to note that patients with dementia, the, the people who are asking for physician assisted suicide, as you can see here, um, the primary diagnosis, neurological disease, um, it's about 25% of people. Um, this is in Oregon. So I pull from Oregon statistics um, because they're easy to access um, and they're updated fairly regularly. So um, neurological disease is about 25%. Um, just so you can see you know, who's asking um, to, to participate. So, um, Relating the dementia scale to assessing a patient with dementia's ability to participate, um, the stages are a guide for how the disease will progress, but it does not mean that dementia will progress at the same rate with the same symptoms for the same person. Um, again, dementia patients should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so the later stages of the disease are characterized by deficits that almost always result in loss of decision-making capacity. Um, so one, the big thing is the loss of the ability to reason associated with loss of executive function. Um, so if you can't reason and go through, you know, I understand what my disease is, I understand what the treatment options are, I understand that I'm going to, die, you know, that you are not capable of making that decision. Um, which is why I'm suggesting that patients with dementia who want physician-assisted suicide ask at the onset of the diagnosis. Um, so when a person with dementia is deciding whether to participate in physician-assisted suicide, um, they will have to use reasoning, their working memory, selective attention, um, the ability to task set and maintain that task setting. Um, so, and that is not always possible with dementia, um, even in early diagnosis. So again, this should be done on a case by case um, basis, but it is very important to note that the assessing physician has to keep in mind um, that the disease is relevant only insofar as it impairs a person's ability to reason. Um, so, you know, upon diagnosis, we are not incapable of deciding um, to participate in dementia and in physician assisted suicide, and that your dementia does not necessarily mean that you cannot participate. Um, so I argue that dementia is a terminal diagnosis specifically for this because you have to have a terminal diagnosis to participate in physician-assisted suicide. Um, so I, there's a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it followed 323 nursing home residents over, um, over 18 months. 
um, in 22 nursing homes, they found that the median survival rate for the patients that they followed um, was 1.3 years. So all these patients had dementia and they lived for around 1.3 years. Um, so they collected data to characterize the resident survivals um, and that included clinical complications, symptoms and treatment um, to try and understand the prognosis and the complications um, that result in people with advanced dementia. Um, they found that over an 18 month time period, 54.8% of the residents they followed died. Um, the patients died from a variety of complications um, such as pneumonia, fever, but the largest percentage, 85.8% um, of people died from eating issues. Um, so they were no longer to eat for whatever reason. Um, from this data, the researchers determined that pneumonia, fever, and eating problems are um, common complications in patients with advanced dementia, and they are commonly associated with a high six-month mortality rate. So there's that six months again. Um, they gave further evidence um, for dementia being a terminal disease based on the fact that the same patients studied, um, none of them died from acute devastating events um, or from any other chronic conditions that they had. So it specifically was the dementia um, that patients were dying from. So the other important thing to note is that patients with dementia do want access to physician-assisted suicide. Um, so there was a study done at the University of Pennsylvania where researchers looked at cognitively healthy, intact, or cognitively intact, healthy older adults um, and who carried the biomarker called amelioid B and that tends to suggest that um, Alzheimer's will develop later in life. Um, the participants in this study group were interviewed several times. Um, the last interview was 12 months later after the markers were found. So people knew that they had these markers um, and then they were interviewed about the markers seeing um, through a series of questions. So of the 80 individuals that were interviewed, one in five said they would pursue physician assisted suicide if they were to become cognitively impaired, were suffering or were being a burden. Um, and many of the interviewees said that they would seek physician asked, said they would seek physician assisted, assisted suicide. Um, and they asked that before they were even prompted. So the last question was, would you seek out physician assisted suicide? Um, and many brought it up before they were asked that. Um, so I just I think it's important to note that that people with dementia um, do want physician assisted suicide because of um because of what it relieves. So suffering, burden to family, um, you know, maintaining that sense of autonomy is very important to people, um, your sense of self and your dignity. So, so people saw that they might lose that, you know, it's just a marker. People saw that that was a possibility and they, they wanted um, control of their own lives and their own deaths. Um, ne the Netherlands allows for patients with dementia to access physician-assisted suicide. Um, so there are 25 cases of patients with dementia participated in 2010. Um, since then, I'm sure more people have participated. Um, but, you know, the question is, why do patients with dementia want to participate? Um, again, it's burden. You don't want to be a burden on your family. Um, there are monetary reasons, autonomy, sense of self, dignity, and the ability to enjoy your life. Um, a lot of times in later stages of dementia, we see that um, people are no longer capable of doing the things that they usually do and that they're used to doing. And that that's really hard for people, um, losing that. So here are the statistics in the US. Um, Oregon, a lot of people participate, 91% participate um, because they are afraid of losing autonomy, um, losing dignity no longer being engaged in activities that make their lives enjoyable and then pain control is another one so so washington has more pain control um you know people are afraid of hospice palliative care um not being able to manage their pain and their symptoms um and so that that's a way to you know ensure that you will die on your own volition when you want to without necessarily losing autonomy dignity um and having more pain. 
Hey, Alex, yeah. I apologize for interrupting. It's Beth. Oh. I just wanted to give you a heads up that we have about eight minutes left and oh, I'm okay. sure this is a topic that's going to generate a lot of questions. Can we try to leave the last five minutes for yes. questions? Okay, yes. cool. thanks. Yeah, I'll skip through. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so the ability to participate in physician assisted suicide, um, for patients with dementia will necessarily mean that within the last six months of their diagnosis, you will not have the ability to participate in physician-assisted suicide. So um, with the goals of avoiding suffering, um, you know, maintaining that ability to um, have decision-making capacity, um, patients with dementia will have to, um, have to ask upon diagnosis. So, my argument is that Death with Dignity Act should simply change their definitions from, um, so I'm gonna use Oregon as the example. So Oregon's statute says, a terminal disease means an incurable and irreversible, dis or irreversible disease that has been medically confirmed and will within reasonable medical judgment produce death within six months. So I'm arguing, take out the six months. A terminal disease means an incurable and irreversible disease that has been medically confirmed and will, within reasonable medical judgment, produce death. So simply terminating the six-month um, guideline, um, which would grant access, obviously, to other, um, other people. Um, but in this argument, I'm only saying that dementia patients want access. They should be granted access. They can if we remove this six month provision. Um, there is a book called The Ine Inevitable by Katie Englehart. She goes into this in depth. Um, there's a group called Exit International, which is a right to die movement group. Um, they allow participation for um, patients with dementia and they actually provide guides on how to um, end your own life. So that is obviously a very controversial discussion. Um, but people with dementia are part of that group. So, you know, they, they do want access. Um, we're seeing that they want access. Um, and in this book, Katie Englehart really dives deep um, and it's a very well-written book. Um, so if you're interested in this topic, it might be, you know, a good, um, a good book to look at. Um, so in closing, you know, dementia is, is a terminal diagnosis you are going to die, it will not be within six months, um, and you should not be presumed incompetent upon um, diagnosis because you may still have decision-making capacity, um, and that should be assessed by your physician. Um, so patients with dementia wanna participate in physician-assisted suicide for the same reasons that people who have access um, to physician-assisted suicide now want to participate. Um, and then the terminal patient definition um, you know, removing that six months, it would make the laws more equitable. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry to ask oh, you to wrap up quickly, but um, if anyone has questions, I would imagine this would generate some questions. Please do um, unmute yourself and, and pose the question to Alex. <clears throat> So great job, Alex. Thank, Thank you very you. much for uh, clarifying the terminology and then making the case for your position. So I'm sure this has come up before, but um, I think one realistic concern that people may have <laughs> is, and you did a nice job of explaining how some um, a substantial minority of individuals who pursue the prescription um, hold on to it. And so obviously in the case of dementia, if this were pursued at the time of diagnosis, um, it, it's reasonable to think that um, in the instance of dementia, that might be um, something that um, you know, more people are doing for the sake of, of holding on to it for later because of the impending decisional um, incapacity. Um, so how do you wrestle with the possibility that when the time comes to take the prescription or fill the prescription, that the person may not have the um, functional ability to self-administer 
and may have lost the you know decisional ability by the time you know the decision is sort of finalized when you um, self administer. Right? Um, so oh my, yeah, so that's a good question, and I think that happens now. So people. Um, with neurological disorders now can ask for the, the prescription at the beginning of their diagnosis and may not take it until the end. And they may no longer be able to self-administer that medication. Um, so, you know, ALS, MS, people may not be able to pick up the, the prescription and, and drink it themselves. Um, the idea is that you get prescribed it and you take it. Um, Obviously it's difficult to control for every scenario. And there may be times when people are no longer capable of taking the prescription when they're ready to take it, um, or they may not be able to self-administer. Um, but hopefully people who are asking for this prescription take it when they are able to ingest the medication and when they are competent and hopefully the physician prescribing you know will give some sort of timeline explain that you have this long to take it you may not have the cognitive ability to even remember that you have the prescription in you know five months um so it's important that you take it sooner rather than later um and the idea is also that the physician is following up with the patient they know that they have this prescription um you know we're keeping tabs on them so it's not you know here's the prescription and go have fun. It's more, you know, we, you have this and, um, you're gonna, you're gonna take it when, when you get it and we're going to follow you with that. So thank you for your presentation. Um, sort of a follow-up to Dr. Lingler's question. The idea that many people um, enact or take advantage of the program and obtain the drug, yet ultimately do not end up using it. We know that many people with dementia, at the point at which they are advanced in their dementia, also do not exhibit distress um, or find their, or find their suffering unbearable. So at that point, you're going to, the, the issue is that a person who is a, in a caregiving role will be the only one to, to act on behalf of the patient. Yes. And how would they make that decision? Like if I, this was my family member and they made this decision because they did not want to be a burden and did not want this indignity of cognitive decline. And so we hold, I and my, the patient, my family member hold on to this. And then my, this person, the patient, um, is, no, is not distressed. They are not the person that they were, they, but they don't appear to exhibit um, horrible suffering. So how, I, I may feel really burdened to make that decision. Um, that's really ethically challenging. And at what point do I enact that? So I think Rebecca Dresser writes um, a beautiful article called Dworkin on Dementia, which um, has, discusses that, dual, um, you know, you're one person when you say, I want this prescription, you know, I don't want to lose dignity. I don't want to be a burden on my family. Um, I want to ensure that, um, you know, I have control over my own death. And then six months later, they're happy sitting, eating pudding and watching cartoons and their dementia has progressed in such a way where that satisfies them. Um, and, you know, I think that's a really hard place to be in. Again, we're hoping that the physician is following the patient so that we don't get there, right? So if they prescribe um, the medication and um, the patient has it and they go to a follow-up appointment, you know, two months later and the physician says, you, you, you're you declined so much, you cannot take this medication. Um, hopefully that helps ease the burden of the family. So it's the physician saying, you know, 
this medication should not be taken. You should not take it. Um, but again, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to account for that. And I think, um, meaning that the patient does no, no longer has the capacity to make the decision yeah. to take it. So in that point, they don't qualify for that particular at, for, under the program. Right. So do you, would the, the medication then be returned to the physician? Hopefully, yeah, that, that's the idea or thrown okay. out or, or whatever. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're hoping, and you typically what happens is physicians who prescribe the medication, it's not, here's your script, I've seen you, you know, that's it. It's usually a physician who's been following you, you know, your diagnosing physician. Um, so they know you, they understand your disease. Um, they recognize when you are competent to make that decision and then when you are not. So it's, hopefully it's not this, here's your script, um, take the medication. It's more of a progression, you know, are you planning to take it today? Are you planning to take it next week? You know, why do you feel like that? Um, and a lot of patients who do request physician assisted suicide are on hospice or are seeking palliative care. So um, there's, it's more, it's more holistic than just here's your script, you know, social workers, um, chaplains, those kinds of things are also involved. Yeah. So it just seems like there's this yeah. paradox between the person who has say an oncology diagnosis has the option to choose to take it or not take it um, based on the suffering they're experiencing in the moment. Whereas the person with dementia is almost being in the position where he or she must preemptively mm -hmm. before, the, so their suffering is almost an anticipatory suffering and right. they're not actually suffering. Um, so they, and they don't know that they, you know, what that will mean for them. And yeah, and that's true. And I in think the future. having the autonomy to make the decision, you know, I, I, feel like I'm going to suffer in the future. I want to make a decision now for my future self. Um, that I just, we can't control for, you know, and, and again, the physician hopefully is following them so that they're, they're closely looked at, they're monitored, um, they, they're talked to, you know, you made this decision, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But that just, is a good point. Yeah. It just seems like there's, it's not this, that the, 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 the analogy to the, uh, to the non, um, to, you know, to the non-cognitive dis diseases, I, uh, you know, is, is a little bit problematic for that reason. That in order to really the, use it, you have to almost preemptively use it. Yeah, and, and that is some of it, um, you know, but people who have, um, other neurological disorders who do have access now who will die within six months may also no longer be able to yeah. make that decision. So, um, and, and same with, um, you know, other diagnoses mm -hmm. you may be so far gone in your disease that you are no longer capable, um, of choosing to use the, the drug that you've been prescribed. Alex, thank you so much. This was a really great presentation and you clearly know this stuff inside out. Um, can everybody please go to the bottom of your Zoom panel and find that little right hand button that says reactions and give her a round of applause or a smiley face or whatever you're feeling like. Thank you so much. We really appreciate this presentation.